Hey, yeah, Cryptozens. Tonight's show. IMF questions Central African Republic's Bitcoin plan. Senator Warren questions fidelity on appropriateness. Luna Foundation guards $1.5 billion BTC purchase. It's 10 p.m. Pacific time. The date is May the 5th, 2022, Cinco de Mayo, and welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter. I'm your host, Nick. The cover model for this podcast is Tex, and together we take a nightly look at the crypto, NFT, and metaverse space and the industry that surrounds it. We're here to bring you the crypto news analysis that you need to start your day. And keep in mind, nothing in this show should ever be considered financial advice. Now, as far as the market goes, yeah, we're kind of hurting today. We had kind of a bunny hop, but we ended up lower quite a bit than what we started. Let's look at the numbers. At the time of writing, the global crypto market cap is $1.68 trillion. That is down quite a bit from the $1.81 trillion yesterday. It's down 7.2% in 24. The top five cryptos by market cap are Bitcoin, down 8%, Ethereum, down 6.96%, Tether, Binance Coin, down 6.17%, and USDC. As far as the NFTs, the global NFT market cap is up over 10.55 billion. Still about even from yesterday. Sales volume, that's down quite a bit though. It's down 9.87% in 24. And finally, a little bit of variety. According to CoinMarketCap, the top five NFT collections by sales volume are OtherD, followed by Beans, Doodles, Board Apes, and WinFT Horse. Now, keep in mind, some of these collections have very volatile prices, so do your own research. IMF questions Central African Republic's Bitcoin plan. Major legal, transparency, and economic challenges. That was how the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, characterized things. In an email to Bloomberg, the IMF decided to weigh in on the Republic's decision to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. They are the second country to do so. And I think that this might be a part of this. When the first country to adopt Bitcoin came out, El Salvador, when they chose Bitcoin, the IMF and the World Bank both threw massive shade at them. Nayib Bukele, El Presidente of El Salvador, said, eh, Bitcoin bonds, Bitcoin city, go away and then proceeded to ignore both the IMF and the World Bank. Whether or not that is a sound economic decision is yet to be seen. Either way it goes, what the IMF and the World Bank cannot have, they cannot have is a stream of little countries thumbing their noses at their politely worded commands. And I think that they're worried. I think they see a second sovereign going the same way as El Salvador, and they're worried. And while I do think they were worried about other countries following suit, the thing that they claim that they're worried about is that it might cause financial instability in the country. In their email, the IMF said, quote, the adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender in CAR, Central African Republic, raises major legal, transparency, and economic policy challenges. IMF staff are assisting the regional and Central African Republic authorities in addressing the concerns posed by the new law. And while I did predict Panama would adopt crypto this year, and it looks like that's exactly what they're going to do, and while I did predict there would be at least two countries to do so, I didn't have CAR in my crypto bingo. And I don't feel bad, because apparently neither did the region's central bank. The Bank of San Central African States has their own currency, the Central African CFA franc, and that is a currency used by five other countries in the region. So that caught the bankers off balance. So keep watch. They're going to run the same game that they did on El Salvador. They've already started by expressing concern. So what did they do? What did they do to El Salvador when they didn't go with the program? They blocked a planned, planned $1.3 billion loan. They were depending on that loan to cover some debt that's due early next year. Meanwhile, the IMF has made it clear that's not happening, not as long as they've got Bitcoin as legal tender. 
So why would the Central African Republic risk the same kind of thing happening to them? Well, part of it was expressed in the idea that Bitcoin is going to spur the local economy and help impress, improve growth because that growth is sorely needed after a decade of civil war. But I think part of it is coming from an idea expressed by Obed Namzio. He is the president's chief of staff. And speaking of being the first African nation to adopt Bitcoin, he said, quote, this move places the Central African Republic on the map of the world's boldest and most visionary countries. And that idea, being afraid of being left behind, is enough to push El Salvador to adopt Bitcoin. It's led the Central African Republic to adopt Bitcoin. And this idea is what the IMF is fighting against. Like I said before, I'm not really a huge fan of the Republic's chances on this one. Less than 12% of their country uses the internet. That's a big thing right there. Most of them come from the capital city. And of 5 million citizens, less than a million of them live in Bangui, their capital city. So, while I wish the Republic all the luck in the world, I just don't see this having a huge impact. Not yet. Senator Warren questions fidelity on appropriateness. That's right. It was in a May 4th letter co-signed with Senator Tina Smith, where Senator Warren expressed concerns about appropriateness. Specifically, quote, the appropriateness of your company's decision to add Bitcoin to its 401k investment plan menu and the actions you will take to address the significant risks of fraud, theft, and loss posed by these assets. Now, there's a lot to that. So, Let's make sure that we have a good feel for this. Let's back up a bit to April 26th, because it was on April 26th where this whole thing gets started. Although the seeds were kind of planted there in a release by the Department of Labor dated March 10th. And this is something that we covered in our April 26th show. It was then that Fidelity unveiled their new digital assets capability for 401k plan. It's called a digital assets account and with it, quote, you can provide your employees access to invest in digital assets, specifically Bitcoin, in their core 401k investment lineup. Now, from Fidelity's standpoint, they're saying the digital asset account is going to let employees that are at least comfortable with the risk and volatility that crypto represents, it lets those folks invest in Bitcoin within the core lineup of their 401k. In their release, they said this will be available to employers mid-year. One that was specifically mentioned was MicroStrategy. They're planning on having this be the first to offer this to their employees this year. And that came as something of a surprise to observers that Fidelity even made this offer. Because it was only about a month or so earlier that the Department of Labor, they sent out Compliance Assistance Release number 2022-1. And that came from the De Labor Department's Employee Benefits Security Administration. And they cautioned that folks, quote, exercise extreme care. Before adding crypto to a 401k's investment menu, see, this is the thing that gets me. All this does is make the option available to employees if the employer chooses to make that option available. As, I, as it stands, I don't think it should be the employer's decision, but I understand why. The fund is in their care. It's their responsibility for its health and care, so I get that. But the Labor Department cautioning employers against giving their employees a choice? That's something I have a hard time with. Anyway, that brings us to today, where the senators from Massachusetts and Minnesota sent a letter to to Fidelity CEO Abigail Johnson. And in that letter, they suggest that Fidelity's plan has a potential conflict of interest. Fidelity has experimented with Bitcoin mining in the past. They also integrated Coinbase accounts back in 2017. Now, Fidelity will let retirement savers allocate up to 20% of their portfolio to Bitcoin. They said it was in response to high demand. The senators disagreed. 
They said, quote, despite a lack of demand for this option, only 2% of employers expressed interest in adding cryptocurrency to their 401k menu. Fidelity has decided to move full speed ahead with supporting Bitcoin investments. They also expressed concerns of, quote, significant risks of fraud, theft, and loss. And they also cited the Labor Department's caution in claiming the risks in cryptocurrency come from, quote, extreme volatility and high speculation, custodial concerns, record keeping, and others. They said, in short, investing in cryptocurrencies is a risky and speculative gamble, and we are concerned that Fidelity would take these risks with millions of Americans' retirement savings. So, as a part of this, they've asked for Fidelity's response. They want to know more about Bitcoin investment fees. They want to know how much money they're making from crypto mining. They want to know how Fidelity is going to address the concerns laid out by the Department of Labor. And they want to know by May 18th. Luna Foundation Guard's $1.5 billion Bitcoin purchase. 80,000 Bitcoin. And it is. It's nearly $3 billion. As it stands, the Luna Foundation Guard's 37,000 plus Bitcoin purchase brings them to almost $3 billion worth of Bitcoin. Their goal is to have $10 billion in their stable coins reserves by the end of the third quarter. They're already one of the top 10 holders, according to CNBC. Their previous purchase was for $139 million worth of Bitcoin in late March. So it's been an exciting couple of months for Terra. They announced their plan to back up their stablecoin, UST, using Bitcoin as a reserve. There is also a very public, very high dollar bet on the value of Luna in less than a year from now. And there's been some discussion on crypto Twitter lately on the subject. Specifically, the question is, is Terra still buying Bitcoin? It looks like the answer to that is yes. And it seems like these purchases were in two parts. Both of them were OTC, over-the-counter. One of them was a billion-dollar over-the-counter swap of their stablecoin, UST. They swapped a billion dollars of UST for a billion dollars of Bitcoin. And they accomplished that deal through crypto prime broker Genesis Global Trading. Now, the second was a much more modest $500 million purchase of Bitcoin from Three Arrows Capital. So that brings the guard's total Bitcoin holdings to over 80,000 Bitcoin. And it's been interesting to watch the price of Luna through this. Now, Luna is relevant to the discussion because Luna is the governance token for the Terra blockchain. UST is the stablecoin for that chain. The primary scheme for UST is to act as an algorithm-based stablecoin, and that's been working well. While the price of Luna is currently down 4.28% on the day at the time of writing, that's down in the middle of a market-wide sell-off. Luna is still up in value over 412% over the last year. Do Kwan is the co-founder and CEO of Terraform Labs. Terraform Labs being the development team behind the Terra blockchain. After a very public Twitter spat with Sensei Algod, Do Kwan is also a participant in a couple of huge bets on Luna's price. So the metric is the price of Luna in one year. And there's some $22 million riding on whether the price of Luna will rise above $88 in a year or not. Now, I do think the likelihood of Do Kwan winning those bets depends in large part on both the popularity of the Terra blockchain and using UST as a stablecoin. Because right now, only Tether and USDC have a higher market value and circulating supply. And that's going to do it for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed tonight's show, like, comment, and subscribe. Give us a glowing review. Do you have questions or comments? Reach out and let us know. The address is nick at cryptoovernighter.com. That's nick at cryptoovernighter.com. 
Oh, and check out my other podcast, Crypto in 5 Minutes. We have 41 educational podcasts, 5 minutes to explain one concept in crypto. And as always, may peace reign. 